I'm so honored to be in the house of the Lord and in the house of such an incredible preacher. Let's give it up for your pastor, Moses. He is away, but not his beautiful wife, his beautiful wife. Let's give it up for the first lady in the house. Amen. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Let's close our eyes and let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, and the power that you have here in this house. I ask that there's anything that's hindering you, Jesus, that you would take control. And that, Lord, the word that is going to be spoken tonight may bring your name to glory. That's all that I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're excited tonight to be here. We're Frontier Church, and uh, we just love being a part of the Fellowship of the Body of Christ. And, and tonight, I want to talk to you on a topic called Scandalous Grace. Scandalous Grace. Would you look at your neighbor and say, Scandalous? No, 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 no. You got to say it like I say. You got to say it. Scandalous. Scandalous is when something's just like so out there. It's just crazy. It's just unheard of. And, and, and God has something that we would call scandalous grace. It's the kind of grace that is, it just doesn't make any sense. And he usually uses it on people that have scandalous stories. He's, he usually uses it on people like you and I that are scared. Now, now, since we're talking about grace, you know, I don't know about you, but I like to draw. For me, I like to draw. So I'm going to ask that you would have a little bit of grace on me tonight because I'm not an artist, but I'm going to, I'm going to, there's, when I was growing up, I don't know about you, but I just love to draw certain things. And one of the things I love to draw was I, I love to draw a house, you know, uh, a house for me, you know, is, you know, that's, that's a place where you say your grace and that's where you pray for breakfast. And you know, I'm, well, hold on, I gotta, I gotta get a nice roof on that. Hold on. Oh, no, that's hot. Uh, let's, hold on a second. All right, here we go. Let me try it again. Here we go. So I'm going to draw this house. A house is a house where you have like the best kind of, you know, you got your little door, you got your window, uh, your window. That's not the right size window. Hold on a second. Let me make it. Now it looks like somebody looking to the left. Hold on. Let me get the. Ah! Hold on a second. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Just hold on a second. Hold on. All right, let me try it over here. Maybe it's from the side I'm standing on. Okay, so I'm going to build a, a house here, okay? And I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to draw my house. Let's do a two-story. And I'm going to do the two little windows. That, that is not a window. Hold on, that's a big door that looks like someone's... Okay, I'm done with this one. All right, all right, I'm going to do one more time. To stay, play, please stay with me, please. Please... Just hold on. I'm going to do my house. It's going to work. Just hold on. I had this all ready. And I'm going to do my house with my little doorway, my little window. There we go. There. I got to put a roof on it, but, you know, here's one thing I realized about what I just did. You know, it's real easy when we make a mistake to throw things away. We get a mar, line is off center. We find that we made a mark, made a mistake. And what do we do? We rip it off. We ball it up. And we throw it away. Ladies and gentlemen, we find that we typically throw things away, especially if there's some kind of scandal associated with us. Especially those people who are caught up in some scandal and we think they did something wrong. Well, who could... And we, we look down at them and go, huh, look what they did. And we rip them up. We ball their whole life up and we toss them on the ground and we say, you know what? They're not worth anything anymore. You know why? Because they're marred. But the truth of it is, which one of us in this room has never been marred? Which one of us have never had a scar? 
Which one of us walked out of the womb holy and righteous? Which one of us had it all together all the time? Anybody ever make a mistake up in here? Can I see your hand in the air? Everybody, now hold your hand hot, nice and high, please. Anybody whose hand is down, look at him and say, you are a liar. <laughs> yeah, look around, look around. He didn't have his hands up. Liar! <laughs> Listen, scandal is all around us, guys. It's in every place we go. But I, I thank God for Jesus. Somebody give, give God a great hand clap of praise. You know, in preparing for this message, I, I was reflecting on a, a, a story that came out about a big scandal. Uh, it involved a CEO of one of the, man, biggest corporations you're going to ever imagine. I won't name any names right now, but uh, the CEO was looking for a president of the company, somebody who could take it over. He found the perfect dude. Dude was sharp. Everybody say sharp. He had it together. I mean, this dude, he, he, he had it all. He was smart. He, he, he knew how to handle business. He was a great manager. He had everything together. I mean, the dude was sharp. But not only that, you know how you get one guy who's just really, really sharp? And it wasn't just him. How many know behind every great man is a great woman? Somebody say amen. 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 I mean, he, had, he not only was a sharp executive, but he had a bomb of a wife. Somebody say amen. Amen. That's all right. I mean, you know, dude had it all together. He had it all together. He had the wife. He had the job. He had it all together. But the CEO said, listen, I'm going to turn it all over, the, the whole company over to you. But, but I need you to just run it a certain way. And the man and the woman got together. They had everything they needed. They had an excellent retirement package. He had job security, job security like nobody's business. He was, he was that good. It's a true story. The husband and wife got together and they decided what they were going to do is this. They were going to embezzle from the company. And they did. They embezzled from the company and, you know, things in secret usually come out. That's what scandal's all about. And they got caught. Well, what did the CEO do? CEO had every right to destroy that man, destroy him. Because, I mean, he gave him everything, and still the guy did all of this. He had the right to destroy the guy. But let me tell you what the CEO decided to do. He, he admired the man so much, he decided that because I recruited you, I'm going to set you up for life. Now, you can't work here right now, but I'm going to set up your entire family. Here's what that CEO did. He not only set him up for life, but he wrote in his will that their family would inherit the business after his death. Scandalous. Ladies and gentlemen, the company I'm talking about and the CEO I'm talking about is God himself and Adam and Eve. He was in the garden, great retirement plan. The dude was the best executive on the planet, had excellent job security, wasn't nobody else to take his job. <laughs> and yet, what did he do? He embezzled off of the tree. Now, the CEO had every right to take his paper rip it off, ball it up, and throw it away, and start over. He had every right to do it. But why did God not get rid of Adam and Eve? Why did he not say, I'm going to focus on your problems and not the person? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to point out to you that God's grace is absolutely scandalous. Why is that? I want you to write this down if you can. God doesn't replace, he restores. Did you hear what I just said? I said God doesn't replace, he restores. He takes you 
and makes you what you're supposed to be. God's grace is enough. Now today I'm going to be talking to both saints and some people who may not know God, so I'm going to be talking to both of you. And I want you to know that God doesn't replace, he restores. In the Bible, the word grace in the New Testament is spoken over 127 times. 48 of those times are in the book of Romans. Grace is a big deal in the New Testament. Let me tell you what grace means by Webster. It means this, unearned divine assistance given to humans, watch this, for their restoration so they can reach their full potential. Wow. It says it is divine assistance by the God, the CEO of the garden, to human beings so they could be restored and then not only just restored, reach their full potential. That means you're going to mess up. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to mess up. Turn the other side and say, you're going to mess up. Now look at your neighbor again and say, just don't mess up on me. That's all I ask, right? That's all. <laughs> we all are going to mess up, but God's grace is designed in such an amazing way. It's restorative. It puts us back where we were supposed to be. He told Adam, I'm in, you're going to inherit the earth. The company is yours. I'm going to do something so that when I die on that cross, you get it all. Watch this. The Bible calls grace charis. It's the Greek word charis. It means goodwill, loving kindness, and even favor. It, it's, it's, it's so different than the world's concept of grace. The world's concept of grace is this, karma. You get what you deserve, right? But charis and karma are two opposites. Karma says you get what you deserve. Charis says you get what you don't deserve. God is not like this world where he treats people bad because they make mistakes or looks down on them. In fact, he goes after people who make mistakes. He will leave all these holy righteous people and go after one person who's gone astray because he's the God of Charis. Ladies and gentlemen, I got to ask you, what side are you on? Are you on the karma side or the Charis side? Are you a person of, of, of punishment or grace? God is the God of grace. I want to show you in Genesis that God never cursed man, nor did he curse the woman. He never threw them away for what they did wrong. Now, now people say, no, they were cursed because you know the labor thing and, and the working hard. No, 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 no. Go back and read it. He never cursed man. They had to deal with their punishment, but you know what? He never cursed them. The only thing he cursed was what caused the problem. I want you to open up your Bibles, if you will, to Genesis chapter 3. True grace doesn't hate the person. It hates the problem. A person who's smart in grace understands the difference. We don't hate what people do. I mean, we don't hate people. We hate what people do sometimes. I want to show you in Genesis, God didn't curse the people. He cursed the problem. We'll find that in Genesis chapter 3 in the New Living Translation. It says, then God said to the serpent, because you, you, you did this, because you have done all of this. The serpent did this to mankind. He says, you are cursed above all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. Do you think God was mad at what they did to, the, to mankind? I think he was a little bit upset. And look what it says in verse 15. It says, and I will cause, watch this, hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. But I need you to pay attention to the next word. He will strike your head. It didn't say they said he, singular. What he was talking about here, ladies and gentlemen, is that there will come a man who will stomp the head of the enemy. His name was Jesus. 
Even in the garden, he had a retirement plan of grace. I want to show you what it goes on. It says, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now, you know, I thought about this text and I thought about why would he strike the heel? Why would he hit the heel? Why would a serpent go after the heel? And I thought about that and I remember what the Bible tells me about Satan. He's the God of this world and uh, the Bible tells me that he's the prince of the power of the air and, the, and that this is the place that he resides and here's what I come to. This is an understanding that I've come to. Like the serpent, Satan will always attack what you have closest to his territory. He will always attack the heel because it's in his territory. He will always go after your heel because that's the weakest side. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what I want you to do. Give Satan no place. He will find the weak area. And don't take long. Give, look at your neighbor and say, give him no place. Look, turn the other, other side and say, move your heel. Watch this, guys. Write, th watch, write this down if you can. God doesn't throw anything away. I love this. God doesn't throw anything away. Here's what he did. Instead of throwing man away, he gave him a promise. He says, I'm going to send somebody to help you. And we find in Genesis 3.15, he sent the promise and it's fulfilled in John chapter 3, verse 16. Anybody know what that verse is? For God so loved, uh-huh, that, so that everyone believes in him will not perish, but have, look at verse 17, most of us forget about. What does 17 say? Watch this. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world but to save the world through him. Grace doesn't judge you. Can I say that again? Grace doesn't judge you. Let me explain. To a person of grace, we don't point a finger at people. We point a finger towards the way. We don't point at people. We point towards the way. Would you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 14, verse 10? Paul begins to talk about how we should treat each other, how we should act one to another, how we should behave towards each other. And most of us think, well, you know, if someone sinned, I just, you, I just, I just got to get them out of my sight. I, don't, I can't deal with sinners. Well, how is the church ever going to grow? Anybody ever a sinner? Up in here? Anybody? Come on now, somebody. We in church or we at the mall? Anybody ever been a sinner up in here? Anybody was a good one? Come on now. Every one of us came from some place. Every one of us once was a sinner. What's the song say? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that I but was that's all of us let me show you what Romans says Romans chapter 14 verse 10 it says so why do you condemn he's talking to church people it's church people we got to ask ourselves are we doing this I hope not it says so why do we condemn another believer why do you look down on another believer remember we all stand before the judgment seat of God we're all going to go there Verse 11, for the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will and every tongue will and give praise to God. Everybody got to see him one day. So if you so, be listen, I'm going to tell you something. Anybody ride motorcycles up in here? Nobody? All the there we go. We got one. Thank you. I ride too, brother. Amen. Power to you. Here's the thing, when you ride a motorcycle, you can't pay attention to the guy over to the right of you. Because as long as you're driving down that road and you over here looking, guess what you're going to do? Wherever you look is where you're going to go. 
And if you're looking at somebody else's sin, guess what's going to happen? You're going to end up going the same way. You got to keep your eyes to the hill from whence cometh your help. My eyes are set to the Lord. I'm not looking at you. I'm not looking at your faults. I'm looking at his solution. Look what Paul says. He goes on to say this in Romans chapter 14, verse 12. Yes, each one of us will give a personal account towards God. And here's the solution, guys. Verse 13. So I love how he says this. It's so relaxed. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble at all. Here's what the Apostle Paul is saying to you and I. I'm not asking you to ignore what's wrong. I'm asking you to live in such a way you don't cause somebody to stumble. If you can focus on getting your life together, you will not be a stumbling block for somebody else. He's saying stop spending the time pointing out everyone else's faults and spend the time focusing on walking with the Lord. That's in Romans. Now, I love the Apostle Paul because Paul is a guy that I, I really think is a cool dude. But Paul has some flaws. It's what I call Paul flaws. Paul was one of those dudes who was self-righteous, and the first thing he did, he fell. He was a guy who thought he had it all together, and then he fell. Now this, I want to say to those people here today, that when the world crashes in around you, what do you do? When it seems like the enemies come in and tapped every good thing you got in your life, what do you do when it seems like everything was going fine and all of a sudden you come head up against Satan and he starts tapping your stuff. Paul was a man who loved God, but he didn't understand what he was doing at the time. And Satan tapped everything he had. And then, thankfully, Jesus showed up. I want to show you something that happened to him. Would you go to Acts chapter 9, verse 1? Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And it says, meanwhile, I love that. It's like that Batman term. Meanwhile, at the Batcave. Meanwhile, some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Saul was uttering threats with every breath. Oh, my goodness. This dude was self-righteous. This dude was pointing out everybody's problems. Look what these Jews are doing. Look what these guys are doing. I, man, these are scumbags. Amen, somebody. Oh, I should have got more than that. Amen, somebody. Amen. These are a bunch of scumbags. And God, I'm going to take care of them. Look what happens. He was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. Sometimes you can point out somebody and you think they're the bad guy and didn't know they already got it right with God. And you point your finger at one of the Lord's followers. Whoops! So he went to the high priest and, and, and we move on to verse 4. He was walking along the ground. He had gone after the Christians and then Jesus shows up. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Hold on a second. I'm, I'm confused. Go back to verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. Okay, verse 4. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? No, I'm confused. Paul was eager to kill the Lord's followers. Followers. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I'm confused. Is he going out to the followers or is he going out to the Lord? The answer is very clear. You may think you're going after a person, but you're tapping the Lord. When a person gets right with God, you can't tell them they're wrong. 
Here's what Jesus said to Saul. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you coming after me? Here's what I love this next verse. Watch verse 5. It says, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. I love the King James Version. I love that one in verse 5. It says, and he said, who art you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuteth. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. What in the world does that mean? What it means is this. In those days, there were farmers. And when an ox wouldn't move, the, the farmer would take out a stick. And he would hit the ox, try to keep it moving. And the ox would kick. And when he would kick, the sticks, the thorns on the prick would stick deeper into the ox. And here's what he's saying. He says, listen, you know, stop kicking. It's just going to make it harder for yourself. How many know that sometimes God uses a stick so that we don't get stuck? God sometimes will cause things to happen to us so that we go get stuck in our position. And he says to Saul, why are you kicking against me? Here's where everything changed. And I, I need you to see this. Paul, the Bible tells us that Paul's eyes, God knocked him down. Scales came over his eyes. He was taken into a city. He was blind, so blind. And a man by the name of Ananias came, prayed for him. The scales fell off of his eyes. But I think he spent too long in that position of judgment of other people because I think that condition continued in his life. Well, why do you say that, Steve? I'm going to tell you why. I think that Paul had an issue with his eyes. People say that Paul had an issue that affected his flesh. And no one says, well, what is it? I think it was his eyes. I want you to take a look at something. Go to Galatians 6 and 11. Paul Every letter he wrote had somebody else have to write it for him. And when Paul had to write, he had to write a certain way. I don't know if you've ever seen this. Paul write, wrote in Galatians 6 and 11 how he had to write. Everybody else wrote normal, but not Paul. Verse 11 says in Galatians chapter 6, Notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. He had to write big letters when he wrote. Not only that, I want you to go down. People were in Galatia were uh, aware of his issues with his eyes. I want you to go to Galatians uh, chapter 4, verse 13. They were aware of his issues with his eyes. He, he was judging so long, too long. In verse 13 of chapter 4, it says, Surely you remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news. When I first preached the gospel, I was sick. Verse 14, But even though my condition tempted you to reject me, something was wrong and you could see it and, and it almost was so visible, you almost rejected me. You did not despise me nor turn me away. No, you took me in and cared for me as though I were an angel from God or even Christ himself. He's being treated like he didn't treat other people. Look at verse 15. This is why I think it was his eyes. Look at verse 15. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? I am sure you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if it had been possible. But notice, for a man with flaws, and as we said earlier, I think we all have them, what is God's solution for our flaws? Whether it's our eyes, our issues, our problems, our finances. What's the answer when we hit that wall, the enemy has deceived us or we got caught up in something we shouldn't have and is God going to tear us off the page, ball us up, throw us away? No. Let me show you in the Bible what God's going to do with you. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. You all right? All right. Somebody can help you. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Watch this. 
Here's what Paul said concerning this thorn in his flesh. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given this thorn. Where? In my flesh. A messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Look at verse 8. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Sometimes we have to go through things in life and we wish they never happened. We say, God, why did this happen to me? Maybe I'm innocent, but I'm blamed for something I did not do. God, take this from me. Redeem me. Use me. God, redeem my name. And God says, no. I'm not. Because I'm making inside of you a heart of compassion for people who are wronged. I can't take it away. Here's what he says in the verse. I love it. He says, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And verse 9, and each time Jesus said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Scandalous. God is not going to pull you out. He's going to come where you are. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no He didn't pull me out of the valley. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Not out of the valley, in the valley. My grace is sufficient for you. I'm closing in this verse. It says, my power works best in weakness. So here's what's Paul's attitude. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness. I'm not ashamed of my testimony so that the power of Christ can work. Use your testimony. Use what happened to you and don't be ashamed. Some of you have been raped, molested, robbed, broken, broken homes, falsely accused. Use your testimony. Quit hiding it. His grace is sufficient for you. Why? Because the Bible tells me why. So that the power of Christ can work through me. Two words to each of you. To the weak in the room and to the flawed. I want to say to you, don't be ashamed of your past. It's your story God will use. And it's in that place he will show up the strongest. This is why Paul says in the next verse, verse 10, that's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults. Oh, talk about me if you want to. And in hardships and in persecutions and in troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then... I am strong. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've been falsely accused or people keep holding your sin over your head, be encouraged. Wear it like a badge and say, but Jesus forgave me. And ain't nothing you can do about it. Ha <laughs> ha! Come on, somebody put your hands together for that one. <laughs> Jesus forgave me. What you got to say? Now, to the saints and the super spiritual, I go to Galatians 6 and 1 as my closing passage. Galatians 6 and 1 to the saints and to the super spiritual. Galatians 6 and 1 says this to you and I. Dear brothers and sisters, if another brother or believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly Help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation. <laughs> Come on, spiritual people. If you claim to be godly, 
but you're pointing a finger, you ain't godly. But if you're truly godly, you go to the one everyone's pointing fingers at and bring them back. Look at verse 2. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. And finally, verse 3. If you, this is to the spiritual, the super spiritual. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. <laughs> I love it. Paul didn't play no games. You ain't, that, you ain't all that now. So then, ladies and gentlemen, when I began this message, I made a mistake in my house. It's a little crooked. And many of us, our homes are have mistakes, we have issues in our lives. We may be a house for the Lord. We may have mars, scars, issues. What does God do? Does he tear off the page of our life and throw us away? Nah. Here's what I've learned the Lord will always do. He would take our lives. He will do what I think is amazing things. He would take our life and engraft us into his. And what other people will throw away, God turns to his glory and makes us and brings us to the cross. He doesn't throw us away. He engrafts us in so that now we're with him. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, that in this room, this house, Revolution Church, will be a house of grace. Not the kind of grace that allows just anything to happen, but the kind of grace that doesn't ignore issues and looks at people who have fallen as people that need to help get a hand up. People who know that the people of our city, whether they have money or they don't, everyone is important to God whether they're marred or otherwise. Lord, let the scandalous grace that saved our lives flow in the hearts of every believer that never again may it be said, look at them, they aren't worth you. May we be a church who loves the broken, the hurting, the lost, and the abandoned. For that is who you died for on Calvary's cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God a great hand clap of praise. The grace of God is absolutely scandalous because you know what? He doesn't look like other people see. He looks at what he wants and he knows when he made you, he's not going to throw you away. He'll restore you. Maybe you're here today. Would you stand to your feet with me, please? Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. I want to give you an opportunity today to say, you know what? I've never made that move because, you know, I always saw God as that angry God. And I never saw him as the one in Genesis who gave up everything so that you could come here and be restored. I want to say to you today, if you're here today, Every, every eye closed and every head bowed. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, today he's asking you to do so. Today, receive the grace of God and the forgiveness of all of your sins and be restored unto God. If you're here under the sound of my voice and you've never given your life to Christ before, I'm going to count to three and I want you to lift your hands in the air and say, I want to be saved. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. 
Three, lift your hands. Lift your hands. I see you. Is there another? Is there another? Is there another? Is there another? All right, put your hands down. If you're here today and you are looking for a church home, a place to grow and call your own, I want to invite you to be a part of Revolution Church, a church that loves its people, who won't judge its people, a people that will go out into the community and be family to you. If you're looking for a church home, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to count to three. And if you haven't joined uh, Revolution Church, I'm going to ask you to do that today. I'm going to count to three. And if you want to join, I want you to lift your hands. One, two, three. <laughs> lift your hands if that's you. Is that you? Amen. If you raise your hand either to be saved or to join uh, Revolution Church, would you come and meet me right here at the altar right now? Come on, let's give them a hand as they come. Awesome. It's all right. It's all right. What's your name? Cassie. 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 And you came today to be saved? Are you ready? Let me tell you what's going to happen. This is a big day for you. I want you to think about everything you may have done wrong since the day you were born to now. And I want to just say to you that in just about a minute from now, all that will be gone. You will be restored to your relationship with God and nobody can touch it. You understand? Your life will change. The Bible says when this is done in about a minute, your name's going to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So if you were to pass the day, you're going to heaven tomorrow. The Bible says not only that, but this very moment, there's a party going on in heaven with your name on it. Okay, are you ready? I'm going to say the words, and I just want you to repeat them, but it's going to be you and God talking. You're talking directly to God, okay? And when it's done, old things will be passed away. And behold, all things are going to become new. Repeat after me. God, God I'm, sorry I'm sorry for all I've done wrong, all I've done wrong. from the day, I was born the day I was born to this moment. This moment. I, believe I believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is, Lord is Lord and died on the cross, died on the cross for, me. for me. Right now, I receive him, I receive him. As, my as my Savior and I believe, and I believe. right now I am born again. In Jesus' name, done. Done. Come on, put your hands together. Cassie, that's it. You hear me? You're like a brand new baby right now. All right, stretch your hands this way, please. I'm going to pray for you, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for Cassie, and I say, God, let your hand rest. Wow. Cassie, let me say this to you. You are a very gifted young lady. Um, I don't know why, but I see you're very gifted in your hands and you're very creative. Very creative. Um, I hear the Lord saying almost like an artist. You could, you're just gifted like that. But there's been words spoken in your ears and words people have said over your life that kind of make you doubt whether you can move where God called you to be. But the Lord says, I want you to remember what I've said here today, because no matter what the enemy tried to do, I'm going to give you the kingdom. I'm going to restore you to your place, and I'm going to give you more than your heart could ever imagine. Cashy, I'm going to say this to you. Um, you may be local right now, but I see you traveling as well. Because your, your heart is big. You want to see the world. You want, to, you want to see more than just local. And God is going to give you that opportunity. And God's going to give you the dreams of your heart. Don't worry about what you have lost. The Lord is going to give you more than that. Let me bless you. Father, I bless her life. And I decree over her life blessings, Lord, that from this moment forward, because she has given her life to you, she will experience more joy, and the sadness will go away. All that sadness, that no more depression. No, 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 no. All that's going to go away. You're going to find you're going to be able to go to sleep at night. It's going to be different, girl. I'm telling you, 
Father, in the name of Jesus, he's taken away all the sadness and given you a joy that will be so unspeakable. You just won't be able to talk about it. Father, I thank you for her life and salvation and her name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, girl. God bless you. Amen. If you're walking back to your seat. We'll have some people from Revolution Church get in touch with you and tell you what your next steps are going to be. Uh, at this point, if you would have your seats, we're going to get ready for communion, and then we're going to close out for tonight. How many love the Lord tonight? Come on, give him a great hand clap of praise.